It's my honor today to introduce our guest speaker, Bob Biger. When, when Bob was named uh, CEO of Disney, the market cap of the company was under $50 billion. Today, 11 years later, it's over $150 billion. And under his leadership, Disney has delivered five consecutive years of record results and a total shareholder return of approximately 400% compared to less than 100% of the S&P during that same time period. Bob stepped into his role in 05 with a clear strategy for the future. He focused the entire company around driving unparalleled creativity, innovative use of technology, new technology, and global growth. He also decentralized decision making empowering his business leaders to adapt the changing market conditions and lead, lead his different uh, divisions to new platforms and new business models. He also heavily invested in the parks and resorts part of his company. This week marks Bob's 11th anniversary as CEO of Disney, and he's here for a conversation about his extraordinary tenure his insights and perspectives about how to operate in this ch constantly changing landscape. Bob became the president of ABC the same year that I bought the Patriots in 1994. And I've had the pleasure of negotiating multiple broadcast agreements with him during that period. And he's earned my utmost respect and admiration. He is not only a business partner, but has become a real good friend. And in the two plus decades I have known him, I, have, I consider him to be one of the greatest CEOs of my lifetime, along with our friend Jeff Immelt, Tom Kennedy, and many others in this room. But the greatest leaders are measured by how they manage and perform under difficult times. And Bob's vision and leadership during the economic downturn have proven to be brilliant moves. And, you know, I can just relate it to him making three acquisitions that I don't think anyone else in the business could have done. And I know the personalities involved. One was with uh, George Lucas in the Star Wars films. And he was able to outmaneuver his competition and buy them outright. And I believe they sold half cash, but he wanted half stock, too, because of your leadership. The other one is a man by the name of Ike Perlmutter, who ran Marvell. And Bob outfoxed uh, Carl Icahn and Ron Perlman, who are not two pushovers, <laughs> in, in doing a great transaction with Marvell, Captain America. And, uh, I can't believe it, but I believe Ike is an employee of the company. Uh, and then the last one, of course, is Pixar and Steve Jobs. And for someone to be able to integrate those three personality, great artists and their cultures into Disney is truly remarkable and part of the reason that has grown the way it has. And one final thought before having Bob come up. Those of us who do business internationally and do business in China especially know how difficult it can be with the regulations and different unique ways of operating. And here's a man who made a commitment and it opened June 16th of this year to a park in Shanghai, a commitment of over $10 billion you, you got to have a lot of confidence and uh, strength to be able to do that. And it's part of what makes him so unique. So it's my honor to ask my friend to come up and answer a few questions. Thank you. That, that was very generous of you. But I'm going to ask you the first question, because we are in Boston. And I understand that a certain quarterback practiced for the first time with his team today. And I think you owe this group, I'm sure there are a lot of Patriots fans in the room, to tell us how he looked. Well, 
uh, you said he practiced the first time today. Was it Monday? Or is it today will be the first oh. day, and I appreciate your support, even though I know you're a great Packer fan. <laughs> Which we understand. Fan, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Um, but uh, look okay. I think he looks fine. I actually Good. saw him in the uh, locker room this morning. At, does anyone ever think he doesn't look fine? <laughs> Especially the women. He He's always so looks so great. Yeah. He always looks great. But um, practice is actually right now. So it's my love of Boston College and Bob Iger that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So you opened the Shanghai Disney Resort, and this commitment, I know, for your company exceeded $6 billion, and I believe the government is a partner with you, or I'm not sure. You know, could you speak a little bit about what you learned about doing business in China and how, what, what role that park has in your future? Well, first of all, the park cost uh, over $5.5 billion to build. And we're partners with the government in that entity. Uh, so we didn't put up all the capital uh, for the park itself. But the government also put in probably 4 to $5 billion extra to build infrastructure around it, roads, power, waste removal. So it's the $10 billion that you mentioned earlier is about right, but a lot of it was Chinese money. Um, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question to ask me, because I'm not sure I could answer it in one afternoon. I, I first set foot on that property uh, surveying uh, on behalf of Disney back in 1999. So it was 17 years from the moment I stood on the property to the moment I actually cut the ribbon. Wow. And in those 17 years, it was one heck of an education. I think there, there's, you know, to simplify it, patience obviously is required for any, any entity that wants to do business on a large scale in China. I'm sure Jeff certainly knows that. One of the reasons for that is China is a very, very dynamic marketplace. It is still a developing country. And because of that, it's changing rapidly. And that change is coming in a variety of different ways. Uh, and so you have to be unbelievably capable of adapting to that change and understanding that the China that you started uh, considering doing business in or negotiating with and the China that you finished with was vastly different. And, and the difference is, if you see it everywhere, obviously growth in spendable income and the economy is one huge one, but just dealing with a, a country whose government is trying to contend with that change and manage it effectively into the future is tricky because every decision the government makes, even on the commerce side, is, is made because they are thinking about where China is going, where China might go, what is good for China and what isn't good for China. And so you, first of all, you can't enter the market thinking that the deal that you make is going to be one-sided, meaning all for you. I think it's even probably appropriate to suggest that you can't even go in with an absolute win-win. They need to feel that it is fundamentally right for them. That's probably the most important. In our case, we were bringing a business to China that was service-oriented. They were trying to move their economy from manufacturing economy to more service-oriented. So we obviously serve that need. We created 10,000 direct and another 30 to 40,000 indirect jobs at opening day. But the land that we have sits on seven square kilometers and has plenty of room to expand. So we'll create a lot more jobs just in that business. And then the developing land around it, which will develop more rapidly because of our presence, that will create a lot of jobs. So that clearly worked. Uh, the government of China also wanted to send a signal to its people that it was open to not only uh, doing business with large Western companies and brands, but we bring to China a, a, a type of ideology, admittedly a relatively benign one as it relates to politics in China, but still a Western ideology. And in, in many ways, that had value to them because I think they wanted to prove that they were not as... Uh, as, as closed off or as um, protective as I think a lot of people accuse them of being. So it, we served their needs. They certainly served ours. It was a lengthy negotiation that got into a variety of, variety of very complex concepts like land ownership, which you, you, is not legal there, as a, for instance, in partnership. But they're the majority partner. But we had to have control. That was obviously complicated. But we ended up with control of all the decision making. 
the whole uh, issue of what gets built and to what extent uh, it represents American culture versus Disney culture. And we actually ended up building something that I called authentically Disney, distinctly Chinese. And that was because I wanted very much to avoid being a cultural imperialist in China because we had experienced similar things when we build parks in other places around the world. And I thought with a rising tide of Chinese nationalism, we could fall prey to something we would have a hard time recovering from, that being the accusations about American cultural imperialism. And we avoided that. So I mean, I'll make a long story short, very complex, very satisfying, because we ended up not only getting it done, but the park that we've opened is doing extremely well. We've not been particularly public about it yet, because it's only been open since June. But the first 100 days were in incredibly successful, and millions of people have already gone. And they're staying for almost two hours longer per day, meaning per visit, than we had anticipated. So the guest satisfaction, which we measure in very granular ways, is very, very high. So it's a, it's a great moment for the company. It is already a decent business, and it represents incredible potential for our com company in the most populous country in the land, in its most populous city, for many, many years to come. Because what is better from a brand perspective than a large theme park that people can go to and immerse themselves in a very high level, meaning quality-wise, of, of uh, entertainment? So it's been great. Well, but it was. Uh, it, Patience, to anything you do, for, it 17 takes 17 years. years. Yeah. That's not the normal American way. So. I told, by the way, I <laughs> refuse to let anybody show me before and after pictures of myself. <laughs> you look pretty good. <laughs> yeah, gee, thank You're you. not Tom Brady, though. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, you know, check, technology has changed the world as we know it, and with so much disruption <coughs> going on, um, how do you lead a company like Disney, that has content, and it, you know, the, what's the role of OTT? You know, do you consider the acquisition that's been reported of Twitter or Netflix because of this changing environment, and how do you view that whole area? Well, I'm, I wanted the company to embrace technology more aggressively. You mentioned it earlier as a core strategy of the company when I became CEO because I thought. It was, in, it, it was in, inevitable that technology was going to disrupt our businesses and that if we tried to fight it off or slow it down or do anything that uh, was aimed at deterring its impact on our business, we were going to lose that battle. And so what I, what I tried to do is position the company as a company that not only embraced technology but viewed it as an opportunity as opposed to just a threat, even though it's very easy to look at it today given its disruptive force, particularly on media, as only a threat. Um, it's imperative, though, that we embrace it, not only because of its inevitability and, and the fact that it's changing us so much, but because uh, it's where the consumer is today. On the media side, you mentioned OTT, which is short for over-the-top television. Over-the-top television is basically getting TV, usually internet provided, without having to go through a cable or a satellite box. That's what over-the-top TV is. And it's, it's, it's the, it not only is it, in a way, more direct, but it typically uses the, uh, the user interface uh, deployed in internet or, or web-based or app-based experiences. Um, and if you look at the world today in terms of the consumer, uh, technology is driving not only what people watch, but when they watch it, where they watch it, uh, how they watch, what they pay for things. And there's been a huge change in authority from the distributor and the creator of content to the user of content. They just have, one, they have much more choice. And with choice, I think, comes a little bit more authority. But these technology, technologies tools are giving the consumer an ability to pick and choose and even price um, in, a, in, a, in a much more consumer-centric manner. So you have to embrace it, because it's not going away. In our case, you know, we use it, obviously, to make our product better. That uh, culture of Disney emanates from Walt Disney's day, where he believed that a technology, by making the product that you make higher in quality, will improve consumption. So he did things like multiplane cameras, which gave him the ability to paint backgrounds in animation in the, in the 30s and 40s and 50s in, in more robust ways, and all the way through to what he brought to the modern theme park, Disneyland, with audio animatronics and 
robots that talked and looked real, as a, for instance, and, the view, and guest satisfaction or user satisfaction was higher. So that's a must, and we, have a, we spent a lot of money on that. But I think the biggest thing that we're trying to do now is figure out what technology's role is in distributing the great content that we have. Because it's one thing to be as fortunate as we are to have Disney and ABC and ESPN and Pixar and Marvel and Star Wars or Lucasfilm, fantastic. But in today's world, it's almost not enough to have all that stuff unless you have access to your consumer who, because of technology, is providing you with incredible data to provide the consumer with a more customized, personalized experience and to basically monetize the whole thing better. And so what we're thinking about a lot is what role does technology have in distributing our content from us directly to the consumer, what must we, how must we invest in that? And the only large investment that we've made in that space is by uh, taking a 33% interest in a, in a Major League Baseball property called BAM Tech, which delivers Major League Baseball over the top uh, to its fans. And we invested in that with a path to control because we want to get more involved in, um, in distributing as well. I obviously won't comment on potential acquisitions, and that should not mean that we're either doing anything or we're not doing anything. But when you mention Netflix and Twitter and Facebook and uh, a variety of other, Amazon, Apple, new entrants into uh, the marketplace, you see companies that were not only technology companies and that were distributing content more, but are starting to invest more and more in making content. Twitter licensing the NFL is an example of that. Amazon making movies and TV shows. Netflix is obviously doing the same. Apple starting to invest somewhat in that direction. So the whole world is changing. And for a company like ours, I think the most important thing is to adapt to the changes that are going on and make sure that even with the great hand that we have, that that hand does not become either less value or less relevant in a world that's so dynamic. Well, just following up a little bit in this world of OTT and cord cutting. If you look at a, one of your divisions, ESPN, and what's happening with especially millennials not subscribing to cable, but also the cord cutting, how are you still as bullish on ESPN as you always have been? I am. I'm very bullish about ESPN because ESPN has created a tremendous brand for itself and has either created or has licensed under long-term deals to the best sports that are out there. We By the way, you. one of the reasons I think you're such a, I'm, uh, you're a fan of mine is that every year we push a button that withdraws about $2 billion of our money <laughs> and deposits it in an account that you're, you're part it's recipient of. one of the best of. deals you've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not complaining about the deal. I'm not complaining about it at all. But ESPN's built a great We're business. giving you 17 great games for that $2 billion. I hope they are. I hope they're all great. <laughs> Even though he thinks Jeff used to get a better schedule. Jeff, yeah, NBC's done all right. NBC's done all right. Um, ESPN's created a great brand for itself. And I think whether, no matter what generation in the United States, there, there are enough sports fans in this country to draw from that ESPN positioned just fine. Uh, what's changed a bit about ESPN, and they've I think they've adapted well, is the sports that people watch today are, are not just watched on a fixed television set in the living room or den or whatever in somebody's house. They're watched in many, many different ways. And not only are they watched in their entirety, but they're watched in snackable form or short form. The amount of consumption of short form video has just exploded, particularly sports highlights. And a staple of ESPN's business was SportsCenter that was scores and highlights. Not only do they have to adapt in terms of moving that content onto mobile platforms, which I think they've done really well, but they have to also think about the disaggregation of the program itself and the fact that the destination that was once SportsCenter, which you turned on, watched for an hour, saw highlights of all those sports, while it is still strong and still quite successful from a bottom line perspective, is not what it used to be because uh, it's been disaggregated by technology, thanks obviously to um, mostly mobile technology. So it's, it's, it's different. And I think ESPN long term will be fine. But I think if you look at the next few years, you're going to see 
uh, more growth in digital platform consumption uh, than in the traditional forms of consumption, which was the multi-channel television package to the household. And as long as ESPN plays that game successfully, which I believe they do, they'll be fine. But there's obviously some skepticism near term about what happens to the expanded basic TV bundle and to what extent will the next generation of people in the United States be interested in that, which is largely, even though the distributors have gotten good at moving the product to mobile devices, but it's largely an in-home fixed TV experience. Actually, you know, that you raised this. Can you speak a little bit about the skinny bundle, how you, what you see happening there? And I, I yeah. mean, how it is. The skinny bundle is a lot of people, the majority of American households that get multi-channel TV subscribe to an expanded basic bundle of channels, which is typically more than 100 channels for some in the neighborhood of 100, call it $100 a month. It varies, it can be $75 a month, it can be 150 channels. But consider basically 100 for 100. There's a huge amount of value there because of all the, the quality on those channels and all the variety that's there. But there are a lot of people that feel that there are a lot of channels that they subscribe to that they don't necessarily want. And they'd like to take advantage of um, basically fewer channels, spending less on fewer channels. And a lot of uh, distributors have created what's called a skinny bundle, which is a cheaper package. But it typically eliminates sports because sports is, represents among the more expensive channels in that bundle. And that resulted in the loss of subscribers for not just ESPN, but some of the other sports services that was in the last couple of years a little bit steeper than Wall Street would have, would have liked and that we would have liked. But that has plateaued, fortunately. And we don't see that, that growing much right now. But it is interesting to consider a world where consumers have the ability to pick and choose what the packages are that they, uh, that they subscribe to. And I think you're ultimately going to get to a point where that authority shifts even more. Now, it could be that when it happens, consumers will ultimately opt for more versus less, but we'll see. I'm not, I tend not to be skeptical about it. I just think it's important to be open-minded and, and uh, realistic about it. Given the large number of strategic acquisitions, which we discussed, Pixar, Marvel, and uh, Lucasfilm, which have helped to drive your growth, aside from the tangible assets of movies, character, franchises, what other benefits and value do these acquisitions bring to you? Well, with Disney, we created a company that has the ability to leverage creative success in many different ways, not just across our businesses, but across the world, because the Disney brand is generally welcome in almost every country in the world, including China, as we talked about earlier. And so we can make a great TV show or a great movie, and it becomes a you know, set of books. We're one of the largest publishers of children's books in the world a theme park attraction or show or parade, a Broadway musical, a game, you name it. And the result is that our investment in the capital that we put into Disney branded content or filmed entertainment returned very, very strong. We get very, very strong returns because of our ability to monetize that way. Consumer products is a very large chunk of it because it's a business that makes somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion a year for us and it's global licensing. And most of that licensing comes from characters that were created in movies and TV shows, dating all the way back to Walt's day. When we looked at uh, Pixar, that was clearly a production company and a brand that was also leverageable, like Disney, across the world, across all of our businesses. And the result is, if you go to one of our theme parks today, you'll see Toy Story and The Incredibles and Ratatouille and a number of other of the Pixar uh, brands and characters. And um, that enabled us to not only justify the $7.3 billion acquisition of Pixar in terms of strengthening our animation business and our movies, but to deliver returns on what was a very, very large investment that were more than acceptable for our shareholders. Marvel fit into the same category, make great movies, turn them into great consumer products and games and books. And now we're starting to build Marvel theme park attractions. We're opening up an Iron Man attraction in Hong Kong in 2017. Wow. As an example, and Guardians of the Galaxy is going to open in Disneyland and, or Disney California Adventure sometime in 17. And of course, there's Star Wars. 
Star Wars is one of the most successful franchises in entertainment that was ever created. And it's exactly, it's a replica of Disney in many ways. You make a great movie, George Lucas made six films, and he turned them into a gold mine in terms of the global consumer products and licensing. And we, in fact, benefited from that, because as Disney, we licensed the right to Star Wars in our parks and paid George for that. So there were attractions in Florida and in um, California that were called Star Tours. So when we looked at Star Wars, we thought, well, if we could continue to make great movies, which is not an easy task, but we believed in our ability to do that, then in doing so, that success would pay enormous benefits across our global collection of businesses. And so we brought Star Wars out in December of 15. Uh, first Star Wars movie released un and produced under us. First one released in 10 years. And it did over $2 billion in global box office. But the success of that film in terms of getting new generations of kids interested in Star Wars and obviously the consumer products licensing business that it threw off and then a very successful game with EA that we licensed and we're building two billion dollar plus Star Wars lands in California and Florida right now which are the largest lands that we've ever built within our theme parks and so it fits the same profile. It's one of the reasons why I think we saw value in those companies that a number of our competitors didn't necessarily see or if they saw the value they didn't have an opportunity to monetize it the way we did. In our case, it wasn't quite plug and play because it just that sounds a little too easy, but it was close to that. Well, I'll ask one last question before we open it up uh, to the audience. And as you're one of the most successful and respected leaders in corporate America today, what leadership insights or lessons do you have for the next generation of business leaders, myself included? <laughs> Although, you know, it's interesting because there are many similarities when, uh, to what you've done. And when I say these things, I say them to describe what has worked for me and what has worked for Disney. I, and I think that there are a common set of leadership qualities that many good leaders have. But they don't have to be, and not everyone has the same set of them, and people can be equally successful with slightly different sets. So what has worked for us is one, um, put all of your focus and, in, and um, make sure that most of your capital is put in creating quality, which is what you've done with the Patriots, as a for instance. It, it, you can, it's very difficult to find examples in this world as dynamic and as changing and as disrupted as it is when something that is of great quality does not create value. So, and I know it sounds so obvious, but as a leader, not only do you have to focus an entire organization on doing that, but you have to demand perfection from them in as, um, in as user-friendly a way as possible, because I think you can get to the point where perfectionism becomes more of a fault than an, uh, you know, than a, than an attribute. But that's first. I think it's really important that uh, you have courage. These jobs uh, in, in this world you know, take, it takes a lot of guts, and in many respects, the CEO of a company, while you've got great teams and a board of directors, et cetera, that provide a lot of input and oversight, a lot of these decisions are singular in nature. They come down to, after you have absorbed and, and, and processed all of the facts and all of the research and all the work that's been done, it comes down to a very singular decision. Do I believe this is what we ought to do for the company? And that you know, takes courage. Uh, and lastly, and I've, I've got a list probably 10 long, but curiosity is a big deal too. And I think particularly in today's world. Without being curious, you don't try new things, you don't innovate, you don't discover new places, you don't go to Shanghai in the 90s or you know, try new technology platforms or, or even have your team create new stories for that matter. And curiosity, I think, is a really, really important thing for, for a a good leader to have today, because I think it, it, it creates not only a lot of energy, but uh, a lot of innovation. It's the, it forms the basis of innovation. And then I'll add two other things as focus and, and decision being decisive. There is a whole set of obvious ones that relate to values, but I think that's, that doesn't need to be said. But I think as a, as a leader, you need to be focused. That means people need to understand what you believe is important where not only you're spending your time, but where you think they should be spending their time, 
you know, where is the value being created from. And then you have to be decisive, too. You get a lot of input. There are, it's very, very easy to, to weigh decisions for long periods of time, particularly if they're large and risky. You don't have the luxury of doing that, nor does your organization, in a world that is so dynamic and so competitive. Thank you. Okay, do we have some questions that people might like to ask Bob? Yes. One thing you haven't talked about that Disney is so famous for is the kind of service culture. Could you reflect on that a little bit? Yes, thank you for asking that. I, I talked to someone earlier whose daughter worked for us at Disneyland, and he told me that she just loves her job. And we do have a great service culture, mostly at our theme parks. And that emanates all the way back from really the mid-50s when Walt Disney opened Disneyland. And we have a very, very, I think, successful and effective training program that trains all of the cast members, as we call them, that now work in our global parks and resorts and cruise ship business. Uh, and I'm proud of the, of the, uh, the efforts that, that they make because it shows up in customer satisfaction. What's most interesting about it is that the greatest learning in the world for them is doing because the reinforcement, the positive reinforcement they get from delivering a good experience to someone who's visiting our theme park, no matter what generation, no matter where they come from, no matter what economic demographic, no, whether they're there for, there for the first time or the tenth time, that positive reinforcement is phenomenal. It's, it's not quite all that we need to train our employees or cast members to give more, but it's a major, major uh, contributing factor to that. We love to, and we believe that it's a competitive advantage, we love to keep, give people experiences that are memorable. And memorable experiences, not just riding on a ride and enjoying the thrill or having a good meal or seeing a good show, it's coming in and feeling welcome, that someone's saying hello to you. I know it's somehow or another, it sounds trite when you answer the phone in, um, in your hotel room at a Disney resort and they say, have a magical day. <laughs> um, but it goes a long way for people to feel welcomed, whether you're running a hotel or whether you're in airlines. And it, it actually surprises us how often we travel the world and see uh, consumer service that's lacking. And we can't quite figure out how companies get away with that. So you'll see our employees picking up trash on the ground. And I, do I will do that as well, by the way, when I walk through. And it's interesting to see it in Shanghai. One of the things that we asked ourselves as we ended up hiring 10,000 people in, in the year before we opened is, you know, how will we teach everyone in Shanghai? And what we ended up being able to do was thanks to a partnership with the Chinese and American government, we brought 1,000 new employees to Orlando uh, for a summer and trained them on that experience and then brought them back and they became the teachers of their other 9,000 cast members in Shanghai and that worked really well. They saw how it's done in the United States. But it's a very, very important component of the success of that business for us. Yes? Relative to the arrangement in China, was there ever a time when you felt as though the deal was not going to happen? Yes, <laughs> there was. There were a few times. Um, I, gotta, I know this is a public forum, but I want to be a little bit careful, but I think this has generally been public. I, the negotiation was sailing along sometime around 2004, and there was a negotiating team on their side, a negotiating team on our side, but the principal negotiator, the chief negotiator on their side was the party secretary of Shanghai. And he was the former mayor, became the party secretary, and he was arrested for corruption. And he's, he's still alive, but he's not been seen by that many people uh, <laughs> since then. And it had a very negative impact on the negotiation we were having. Very. It stopped it cold, completely cold. And we had been at it for a few years at that point. And uh, I wasn't certain that it would ever restart, but fortunately, the interim party secretary for Shanghai was a man named Xi Jinping, who happens to be the president of China. But after he left Shanghai, he ultimately found his way to Beijing as vice premier, a very, very influential vice premier. And it was actually thanks to him, and he, he and I have actually recently talked about this, that he enabled not only the negotiation to restart, but the, ultimately the negotiation to conclude, which was 2011. It took that long. 
But there were times back in the dark days of 2004, 2005, 2006, and we pulled everybody out. We stopped everything. There was nothing to be done. And I didn't think we would ever start again. But I made a trip over at some point and said, oh, are you ready? <laughs> Can we open up shop again? It's basically what happened. We have, yes. Uh, you've got a very interesting board of directors of technology and social media and otherwise. Um, what's the role of the board plays in navigating this technology in the future? <laughs> That's really a good question. We, we've worked really hard as a board at populating the board with people that not only we respect and are fully capable of doing their job, obviously on behalf of the shareholders of the company, but of giving us input, feedback, and, of ch and challenging us in a number of different ways. And so we've tried to include on the board not only people who are steeped in technology. Steve Jobs obviously was a great example of that. Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook, Jack Dorsey from Twitter among them. A man named John Chen who currently runs BlackBerry. I was going to say RIM. They changed their name. Uh, but also on the board of people who have been in global consumer products. The most recent appointee to the board was Mark Parker, who's the chairman and CEO of Nike. As a, for instance, we have a woman who was vice chair, was vice chair of Procter & Gamble, and, so, and someone else who ran Estee Lauder. So we have people that, when they sit around the table and we talk about uh, the brand health in China or doing business with the government there, or dealing with um, you know, some of the risks associated with business in Latin America or the disruption of disruptive force of technology, um, and, or a number of other things. They can really give us input. Actually, our lead director was one point the uh, CEO of Starbucks, another example of that. And I love the fact that when I look at the board and take them through some pretty big issues uh, and ideas, that they all have a perspective that um, gives them the ability not only to comprehend what we're talking about and what we're experiencing, but to challenge us, ask the right questions, and uh, I think do a more effective job on behalf of the shareholders. And I, I actually, there's, I'm sure a lot of CEOs in the room you know, probably will say, you know, going to a board meeting sometimes in something you absolutely look forward to because there are a lot of questions asked and you're put on a hot seat and, it's a lot of work, too. I find in the 11 years that I've been doing this job that I actually get stimulated by our board and welcome the, welcome the, the communication that we have with them, that I have personally with them, and that all senior management does. We've also tried to be very diverse as well. So we've had a number of women on the board, people of color, Asian Americans. We've not had that many from international markets, which is sort of the next thing that we're focusing on. You know, could I maybe ask, I don't, the, the whole, it, let me just, before we do, the area of security, you deal with tens of millions of customers, and in the world we're living in, how do you look at that whole area to protect Disney? All the time, all the time. Um, obviously, we're a global brand based in America, so, there's a, an association made by, as they say, bad actors in the world. Uh, we obviously have a huge global footprint, and in some cases that footprint is manifest in very, very physical ways. A theme park in China is one, but only one of many. Four cruise ships, as a for instance. Actually, the, the issue today that I've been dealing with is, this, is Hurricane Matthew and where those cruise ships are. There isn't actually a day that goes by when there isn't some issue related to um, you know, managing the, the physical space and the well-being of our, of our employees and our guests. You can only imagine when you've got four different itineraries. And a ship that was sitting in New York that was supposed to fly south and can't fly, uh, fly, uh, sail south and can't sail south. So I got an email when I was sitting at the table. It's going north to Canada. <laughs> and they're giving everybody on it, I guess, a chance to um, to get off if they don't feel like going to Canada. <laughs> Nothing wrong, it's a nice time of year to be in Canada. Um, we actually have owned an island in the Bahamas, so that's, we've been dealing with that for the last few days and giving people that work there and live there for us a chance to evacuate and others that will have use of a storm shelter. And I don't have a report fully on what's going on there in the last few hours. But clearly, given what's going on in the world today, uh, particularly in Europe and Paris, um, we, uh, it's uh, the subject of security 
is something that uh, we deal with all the time. We take it very seriously. We've invested very heavily in it and continue to. We have fortunately really good relations with not only local law enforcement authorities, but, um, but uh, nationwide and countrywide, whether that's in France or in Anaheim or in Shanghai. And I think it's, unfortunately, it's the way of the world today. You can't do business in today's world, certainly the way we do it and the way a lot of other companies do, without spending time uh, on and spending a lot of money on those issues. And I ask about it all the time, all the time. I don't want to wake up one day and find out that we could have done something to prevent something, and we didn't either because you know, we, were, we were trying to manage our budget too carefully or we didn't think about it or whatever. So it takes a, it takes a lot of focus. And fortunately, we, you know, we've, I shouldn't even, even say it, but we've generally you know, been okay, even though we know, who we, given who we are, you know, that, um, that there are vulnerabilities. Yes. My name is Bill Spillow. I own an emerging media company here in uh, New England called Zero Water Media. And uh, prior to that, I actually worked for you at ESPN. I worked there for 15 years. I produced a show called that about prime time uh, with Chris Berman. Mm -hmm. Great guy, great guy to work with. And I know a great friend with Bob as well. Uh, but I also grew up following Walt Disney part of it. And a lot of his works and his thoughts and been to Disney World many times. Seen the camera that you were talking about that's in his experience uh, at Hollywood Studios or Disney Studios. And, uh, my question to you is this. What is it like on a daily basis to be the man that walks in his shoes? And do you often find yourself with these big decisions to make just simply saying, what, what would Walt do this? <laughs> So interesting that you ask that. Um, we, about a year, or well, less than a year ago, we reconstructed Walt's office on the Disney lot in Burbank uh, in the, I'm told, virtually exact way that he left it uh, when he died in uh, 50 years ago this December, including pencils on the desk and note cards and scripts that he was working on and a bulletin board that has plans for all kinds of new Disneyland attractions. And, and he was also starting to work on developing Disney World in Orlando, where he had amassed, whatever it was at the time, 30,000, 30, 40,000 acres of land in central Florida, all very, very um, uh, quietly. Uh, and it's great to go into that office. I actually spent a couple of hours there a few Fridays ago. It was a quiet Friday, late summer. And I had been there to cut the ribbon when we opened it, but I decided I would go in, not to sit in his desk, by the way, I avoid doing that, but just to look around and just kind of get a, a bit of a feel, because I guess if you're in the physical space that the person worked in, you can somehow, somehow or other you get a sense for who he was and learn, even though I've read a lot. And it was a nice experience. Uh, I don't ask myself what he would have done, uh, because the world is just so different today, although certain principles that guided him guide us today. What I talked about earlier, just about focusing on quality, as a, for instance, he was great at that. But it's such a different world, and I think a lot of decisions that we make wouldn't necessarily be applicable. Um, that said, in part because I'm asked about it, in part because I do think about it, what we think of the company that he founded in 1923, what would he think about it if he saw it today? And uh, his grandchildren are still around. They're not involved with the company, but I talk to them every once in a while. His son-in-law is still alive. His, one of his daughters died uh, within the last couple of years. I talk to them occasionally about it. And I happen to believe that he would be really proud of the company that he created. Star Wars would have been something, and George Lucas said this, that Walt Disney would have invented, <laughs> you know, when you think about it. Um, and I, you know, I think Probably. that, what's that? Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland, that's right. Although, interestingly enough, Walt had it easy with Tomorrowland, because Tomorrowland in the 50s was about microwave ovens and, <laughs> and get this, telephones where you could actually see the person when you were talking to them. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Today, what we, we decided, uh, going all the way back to Shanghai, one of the decisions we had to make is, what do you put in Shanghai today? Walt had four lands in Disneyland, Adventureland, Frontierland, uh, Fantasyland, and Tomorrowland. 
Frontierland was based on the American West and Davy Crockett. You don't try that in Shanghai today. <laughs> the Davy who? Like, you don't do that. By the way, we didn't put Main Street in. Main Street in all of our parks was loosely based on a town, Marceline, that he grew up in as a kid. And I didn't think that would resonate to the kids in Shanghai, so we eliminated Main Street, which was blasphemy. Uh, but we, tried, we did do tomorrow, put Tomorrowland in, and we had to ask ourselves, and to, to today's kids, what is Tomorrowland? What, you know, because there's so much science fiction that is driven particularly by high-end computer graphics where you, you have a vision that is so rich, whether you're playing a video game or seeing a movie. It wasn't an easy thing, so we designed something that was basically a world that is healthier, cleaner, safer, not quite safer, I mean, that's kind of obvious, but a more idealized version of what today's world is environmentally friendly, that, that sort of thing. It also has a great, Tron. we have a ride that's fantastic in it, which is called Tron, which is light cycles that were in the movie Tron. It goes 60 miles an hour out, you shot out of a building at 60 miles an hour. Anyway, that's Tomorrowland. But anyway, I think about Walt. I, when I drive on the Disney lot, I grew up in the 50s in the United States, so I remember watching the Mickey Mouse Club and Walt Disney building Disneyland on TV because he featured the park as it was being built on a program every Sunday night. I remember it vividly. I've watched some of those shows. And I, 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 I marvel at the fact that I have this incredible opportunity in life to run the company that was founded by Walt Disney. And so when I think about Walt, I mostly think about it as a means of my reminding myself how appreciative I should be of the opportunity I have, rather than, hey, I've got his job, or you know, what would he do? One last thing I thought interesting. When Steve Jobs was dying, and he and I got very close, not just because he was a larger shareholder of the Walt Disney Company, but he exhorted the team at Apple to not do what had been done at Disney for so long after Walt died, where everybody walked around, not only in mourning, but asking for years later, what would Walt do? And Steve told everyone at Apple, do not ask what Steve would have done. And Tim Cook, who runs Apple, has been fantastic at that. I have the privilege of sitting on that board, and I know for a fact that Tim is not doing that. He thinks about Steve every day in, in deeply respectful ways, but he doesn't revere him to the sense that he's trying to do everything Steve would have wanted Apple to do, because he knows that the world that Apple operates in is so different, even than the world that was, existed when Steve died in 2011. It's good advice. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.